Excellent. Well, as I said before, welcome. And again, if you're with us for the first time, right now we are in a series called This Crazy Book. And we've been looking at how, uh, how as we come to the scriptures, for so many of us, we're intimidated because we come to it in a way that's different than we would come to any other book. And we have this idea that it's a magical book, and, and we have this idea that, well, you have to have a degree to understand it. We have, we have all, these, uh, all these lies that come into the way that we approach the Scriptures. And so we're trying to address that and look at, okay, how, how do we begin to break away from some of those lies? And, and, and is it possible for us to begin to come to God's Word in a way in which not only do we understand it, but we begin to actually experience God in it and looking at how God is trying to not just instruct us in his word that the Bible's not just a manual for living but but how God is trying to introduce us to himself in his word and so as a part of that we, we've been addressing lies and then we've also been looking at how we can expand the questions that we ask as we come to God's Word, because it's not always going to be, okay, this is wrong and this is right. It's not going to be that all the time. It's not just an instruction manual. So then how do we begin to expand what we look for? And we're introducing you to those things. And so we looked at, okay, how, how can we begin to look for truth? Is there truth in this passage? Some way in which I see the world that needs to change, a way, that I, a way in which I see myself that needs to change? Is there an example in this passage? Is there a promise in this passage that I can grab a hold of? Is there something to be learned from immersing myself in the story? Is there a theme in this passage, something that God is reiterating over and over and over again to communicate priority and importance? And we're opening our, we're expanding the questions that we're asking so that we're opening ourselves up to be able to actually see that God is doing more in his word than just telling us, okay, this is right and this is wrong. That God is trying to help us see him through all of these different things. For us to see how he interacts with someone who struggles with what we, what we struggle with and see how he speaks to them and how he addresses that so we can understand how he's addressing and speaking into our Lives And as we walk through this, we're not just trying to teach you this, we're trying to demonstrate this for you. So we've been walking through the book of Acts. We began last year, and we put it on pause, and we're coming back to it now. And as we've come back to it, we've picked up in Acts chapter 3. Last week, we began Acts chapter 3, and we saw this amazing miracle where Peter and John heal this individual who was lame since birth, was crippled since birth, and, and then all of a sudden, Peter speaks into that moment, and he's healed. All these people flock to them. And, and today, as we pick up where we left off, we're actually going to do a little bit of overlapping here. So last week, we looked at the miracle, and then we looked at how Peter began to share Jesus with the people around him as a result of it. We're actually going to go back to where Peter begins to share Christ today because I think there's more than, than just what we saw last week to be able to learn from this passage. So there's going to be a little bit of overlap. If you go back to last week, you remember that there's this miracle and then all of the people, because they knew this guy, they, they had seen him every day at the gate of the temple. They knew that he was crippled and now they're, they're watching him walk and they've known him as old. They've watched him literally grow up knowing that he can't walk and now he's walking. And so this crowd begins to assemble. And Peter, seeing the opportunity, he begins to share Christ. And I want to go back to that because I think there's something here for us to be able to learn as we see Peter speak. So we're going to pick up in uh, verse 12, chapter 3. So on your online program, all the verses are there. You can read along. It's just hobokengrace.info, and you can pull those up. But, so picking up in verse 12, it says this. It says, Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. People of Israel, he said, what's so surprising about this? He's talking about the healing. He says, and why stare at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power or godliness? He said, why are you looking at us like we're the ones who, who did this or that in some way, shape, or form we have the ability to, to do this, that it's our own power? He says, no, no, no. He says, for it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he, so there he's connecting with them and he's talking about, he understands. Listen, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're in this together. 
He says, it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all of our ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. He says, no, this, this isn't about us. This is about Jesus. And the fact that God, again, is confirming who Jesus was, and God, again, is showing that Jesus was his son. He says, who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate. Despite Pilate's decision to release him, you rejected this holy righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this fact. It gets a little intense there for, for a moment. He's like, yeah, you know that, that Jesus, the Jesus that you decided to hand over to be crucified, the one that Pilate wanted to release, but you decided that you wanted to release the murderer instead of him? He says, that Jesus... He says, through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed, and you know how crippled he was before. He says, you guys know this guy. You know the, the amazing miracle that God has done here. He says, and you know, he says, faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. And this is an important line. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. He says, I realized, I realized you didn't know what was happening that you didn't know what you were doing. He says, I realized that it was done in ignorance, but God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. He says, then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord and he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah, for he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his prophets. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. Listen carefully to everything he tells you. Then Moses said, Anyone who will not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from God's people. Starting with Samuel, every prophet spoke about what is happening today. So this isn't new. If you go back, you realize that all of the prophets have been telling us that this is going to happen. It says, you are the children of those prophets, and you are included in the covenant God promised to your ancestors. For God said to Abraham, through your descendants, all the families on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant Jesus, he sent him first to you people of Israel to bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. He, he, says, he, he says, you remember the promise that was given to Abraham, that all of the world was going to be blessed through you. He said, That's done, that has been accomplished through Jesus. And, and typically, typically when we come to this passage, we read through this passage and we say to ourselves, okay, that, this, this is just a truth. It's a truth of what Jesus has done. It's just a truth of, of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of Jesus Christ, that this is what Jesus has done for you and for me. But one of the great things about the scriptures, and as we continue to talk through, okay, what are the different questions that we need to bring to this? How do we expand our perspective? One of the great things about the scriptures is that oftentimes inside a single passage, you're going to find multiple of these. You're going to find many of these. And so there will be an example and a truth, or there will be an instruction, and at the same time there will be a promise, and maybe even an encouragement, all in the same truth. This is one of, this is one of the great things about reading through the Scriptures over and over and over again, because oftentimes you read it through a passage that you have read many times, but all of a sudden a new one of these things opens up for you, and so all of a sudden, for the very first time, you see it as an example. Or all of a sudden, for the very first time, you see the promise in it. And so it's, it's amazing how as you continue to read through God's word, these things become more and more apparent to you. Remember what we talked about last week? You, it's, you're not, this is not, there's no book in your life where you open up and you say, well, I'm going to understand this perfectly the first time that I read it. That's not true with the Bible either. It takes time. It takes reading through it and allowing yourself to be able to, to digest it and interact with it, not just one time, but multiple times. We're not looking at this on a short-term basis. We're looking at this on a long-term basis. Where can we be in five years if we continue to read through God's Word? And these different things will begin to come alive in these different passages the more that you read through it. As you look at this passage, it's, ve it's very apparent that there's a truth. There's, it's very apparent that, that there's truth about who Jesus was and what Jesus did. But I think that there's more than that. One of the things that I hear people struggling with frequently as we're on this journey together, is this question of how do I communicate Christ? 
And the reality is, is that if you have stepped into this relationship with Christ, or, or when you step into this relationship with Christ, for those of you who are exploring this, the reality is that from the moment that you step into this relationship with Christ, from the moment that you trust him, you are given a mission. You are given a purpose. You have a purpose to be here. And that mission is to make disciples. Listen, you are to go. Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. Here's why I'm leaving you here. You go and you make disciples. Well, what is Peter doing in this passage? He's making disciples. This is what he's doing. He's communicating the truth about Jesus Christ to make disciples. And so when you come to these passages where, it's, where, where you see someone sharing Jesus... It's not just the truth. The passage is not just a truth about who Jesus is. It's also an example. It's also an example to learn from. And when you look, you're going to see this frequently throughout the book of Acts, where you see Peter, you see Paul communicating the truth of Jesus. It's an example to pay attention to. And all of us struggle with the question of how do I share my faith? How do I communicate the truth of Jesus? And these aren't things to memorize and then recite. It's not an example where you're going to be able to memorize this and recite it to your friends because it's not going to apply if you say to them, you, you killed the author of life, right? That's not, that's not going to apply in that situation. But at the same time, there are principles or things to learn as you hear these different people sharing Jesus and, and, and to be able to bring into the way in which we communicate Jesus or what we believe is important in our communication of Jesus, and I think when you look at what Peter's doing here, he's setting an example for us, and he's calling us to something that is very important. And it's something that I think, I think many of us struggle with in our communication of Christ, because I typically, I hear this a lot, I hear people talking about truth and grace as if they're opposed to one another. And, and so they're interacting with, how do I share Christ with the world around me, and I, I want... Uh, do I share truth or do I share grace? Do I, do I, and I, I hear people say, well, I don't want, I don't want to make anyone feel guilty. So I, I, I want to make sure that I communicate grace because I don't want, I want to make sure that I don't make anyone feel guilty. And I think in that there's a divorce between truth and grace, like they are opposed to one another or like they, like they exist independent of one another. But when you look at the example that Peter sets here, when you look at the examples of Paul as he's sharing Christ, as you, as you read through the scriptures and what it communicates to us about Christ, there's a flaw in that. There's a huge flaw in that. And when, and when Peter is communicating here, he doesn't look at it and say, okay, do I communicate truth or grace? He comes into it and says, no, 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 I, I have to communicate both. And Peter doesn't see them as opposed to one another. As a matter of fact, as you, as you listen to what he's saying, and really throughout the scriptures it's teaching us that the two are intricately linked, and they cannot exist apart from one another. They cannot exist apart from one another. And so as Peter comes into this, he understands, if I'm going to communicate grace, I must communicate truth. If I'm going to communicate grace, I must communicate truth. So he doesn't just communicate one. He goes into it and he communicates the truth. And the truth is what? The truth is they're guilty. The truth is they are guilty. And so he goes into it. He doesn't just go into it and say, hey, listen, God loves you. Everything's okay. He doesn't do that. He goes into it and says, listen, you killed him. You, you, you need to understand something. You killed him. The, the author of life, the one that you were looking for, you killed him. And it's interesting because he, he also, he communicates truth, but he also communicates with gentleness and respect. And I know the first time that you read through it, you hear the, you killed the author of life, and you think that's not gentle or respectful. But if you read through it carefully, you'll see that he actually does. He uses words like friends. He's connecting with them and talking. He doesn't divorce himself from it. He's right in the midst of it. And so he's talking to them about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's connecting with them. Listen, this is, 
I, it's the same God that you follow that I follow. And, 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 and so he does so in a way that's gentle and respectful, which is something that Peter actually teaches us to do in First Peter. First Peter chapter 3, Peter says, Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have, but do so in a way that's gentle and respectful. And so as you walk through it, you see he's using words like friends. As he, gets to, as he continues to explain, listen, you killed him, he, he comes into it and says, but I understand you did this in ignorance. He says, I understand you didn't, know, you didn't know what you were doing. But he communicates truth. And then he communicates amazing grace. He says, you killed him. But he hasn't rejected you. He's not done with you. He's not angry with you. He's not going to destroy you. He's actually going to use what you did to rescue you. He's actually going to use what you did to rescue you. Listen, listen to that last line. He says, When God raised up his servant Jesus, he sent him first to you, people of Israel, to bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. He says he wants to rescue you from the very thing that's destroying you. And you see him communicate in this moment truth and grace. And I think it's very important for us to see this example. It's very important that we learn from this example. Because if we begin to believe that truth and grace are opposed to one another, or if we begin to believe that they are disconnected from one another, we we begin to develop a very dangerous and a very false idea of who God is. You see, the reality is this. Grace cannot exist without truth. Grace does not exist without truth. And grace cannot exist without guilt. Let me say that again, because one of the things that we talk about here at Hoboken Grace a lot is the fact that grace eliminates guilt. And it does, but make no mistake about it, grace cannot exist without guilt. And so Peter, Peter wants to share with them grace, but in order for, for them to understand grace, they have to understand their guilt And so he begins and he says, listen, this is the truth. Grace cannot exist without guilt. Grace without guilt is just injustice. That's all it is. When we come into it and we say, listen, God's just a loving God. God, 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 just, God just loves you and he's okay with it and you don't have to worry about guilt. That is just injustice. It, it, that is God looking at the world and saying, listen, you know what? I'm okay with the way that you hurt one another. And that's injustice. Romans goes into grace in excruciating detail because one of the things that God wants for you to understand is that grace is all about justice. And that in God's grace, God is actually demonstrating the beauty of his justice. And the fact that God is not okay with the way that things are. And God is not okay with the way that, that we hurt one another. But in order for us to know grace, we must understand guilt. One of the reasons that the Pharisees couldn't accept grace is that they wouldn't accept guilt. And Jesus kept saying, I want to bring something really beautiful into your life, but you guys continue to act like you don't need anything. And I want, to, I, I want to bring forgiveness into your life, and I want to bring love into your life, but you guys continue to act like you're fine. When the reality is you're not. And in order for you to be able to know the beauty of grace, you have to understand guilt. And for some of you, the reason why you don't get excited about grace is because you haven't confronted your guilt. And the reality, the reality that it wasn't just those people's choices that put Jesus on the cross. 
Jesus went to the cross to carry your sin and my sin. The reality of our guilt that we have done tremendous, tremendous harm to him and to the world around us. That the evil is not just out there, but that the evil is in here. If you don't confront the reality of your guilt, you'll never celebrate the beauty of grace. Because it's in our confrontation, it's in our realization of our guilt that we understand all that Jesus took for us. If we feel there's little for him to take, we will celebrate it little. But when we understand the depth of what we need to be saved from, we will celebrate it much. As your understanding of your guilt increases, your celebration of grace will as well. The reality is for every single one of us. We have stood guilty before a pure and almighty God. And he decided rather than to punish us in our guilt to give his life to rescue us from it. And you don't have to live under it. And this is the message of Peter. What is he saying? Listen, you don't have to live under the guilt of what you did to Jesus. Because Jesus came to rescue you. And he's actually made it possible for you to be forgiven of that. And he's, he's made it possible for you to be able to see the beauty of that. And for you to be brought into his family and he's sharing with us, them this incredible truth of God's grace. But what makes it so abundant and what makes it so amazing, and the reason why we use this word amazing whenever we talk about grace is because we're aware of how guilty we were. Because we're aware of the fact that the evil is not just out there. The evil is in here. We're aware of the fact that we needed a Savior. And God saved us. You see, we can't see truth and grace as being divorced from one another. And I think it speaks to how we share the message of Christ with the world around us. And Peter, in this moment, he talks about it and he shares it from the perspective of their sin. But as you read through the book of Acts, you see Paul begin to share it with people that he wasn't connected to and share it in different settings. And Paul often shares it from the perspective of his sin. And so he says, let me tell you about Jesus. But first, let me tell you about me. Let me tell you how, how screwed up I am. Let me tell you about how broken I am. Let me tell you about the things that I've done that, that really should make it impossible for me to ever have a relationship with God. And he begins with truth. Let me ask you something. When you share the story of Jesus, who's the hero? And who's the enemy? In order to share Jesus well, we have to communicate the truth that we were the enemy. The truth of our own guilt. The truth of the fact that we needed a savior. And then the beauty of the fact that Jesus did that for us. See, Peter doesn't just communicate one without the other. He understands the two are intricately combined. And, and there's, a, there's a lie in our culture. And I think when you listen to that song that Dana sang, I, I think that the writer wrote it with a good intention. She wanted to talk about the fact that, that you, you don't need to find beauty in the way that the world thinks you should find beauty. And I think she wrote it from 
a good perspective and with a good intention, but there's a lie inside of that song that has so permeated our culture and is incredibly devastating. And, and it is beginning to work its way into the way that we talk about and the way that we interact with the message of Jesus Christ. And the lie of that song is this. The lie of that song is that you just need to be true to you. The lie of that song is that, that, that the best you is the you that is true to you. And you need to look inside and figure out who the real you is. And then you just be true to that. And the world can change what they have to say about it. And they should just accept it. And I'm going to find who I am by looking inside of myself. And then I'm just going to be true to that. And if I'm true to that, and if the world stops telling me that that's not okay, then I'll be happy. There's no better life than that. And, and as you listen to that song, it's time you just need to be true to you. You figure out who you are. You be true to that. And then you're going to be happy. There's a hope that's waiting for you in the dark. And the hope is found in just being true to you. There's no better life than the life that we live. There's no better you than the you that you are. And this is beginning to permeate our culture. Where we're saying, you just need to figure out who you are. Be true to that. And then you, you just make sure that, you, that no one ever criticizes that. And you don't have any right to criticize who someone else is because they're just being true to who they are. Let me, let me, let me tell you something. And if you're honest with yourself, you'll know that this is true. Listen. If there's no better you than the you that you are, and there's no better me than the me that I am, listen, there is no hope in that. There is no hope in that. If this is the best that it gets, if this is the best that there is. That's not hope. That's devastating. Because the reality is that day in and day out, we make decisions that destroy the people around us. The reality is is that we need someone to save us. And if you try to find, if you try to find the real you by looking within, you'll begin to define yourself by some appetite or some, some, type, of, uh, of, uh, some type of urge, feeling. You'll begin to define yourself by something that's going to destroy you. You don't find you by looking within. You don't find you by looking at what culture says about you. You find you by looking to him, the one who actually created you. But there's this lie that says you you just need to be true to who you are. And it's beginning to it's beginning to infiltrate the way that we talk as followers of Christ. And so we share with one another a lie, a lie that is extremely devastating. And some of you may have even said this to the people around you, where we say, we say this thing. We say, Jesus accepts you just as you are. That's not true. That's not true. Listen, Jesus loves you right where you are. But Jesus gave his life to make sure you don't stay there. Jesus loves you right where you are. And he values you. And he's passionate about you. But Jesus does not accept us as we are. He does not accept the brokenness of us. He gave his life for us to be reborn. He gave his life so that the moment we place our faith in him, that instantly we're made a new creation. Why? Because he's not okay with where we are. And he's given his life to make sure, to make sure that we could be rescued from it. 
and that we could become not who we are, but that we could become who we were created to be. And Jesus is passionate, passionate about moving into your life and my life and addressing the reality, the truth, the truth that we are not who we were created to be, the truth that we have fallen far short of the glorious standard for which he created us, the truth of the fact that we need to be saved. And he stepped in and said, listen, if you'll let me, I'll begin to lead you to who you were actually created to be. That's the hope. The hope is never found in the dark. The hope is always found in the light. When we're honest about who we are and we confront the beauty of how God's grace is making sure that we don't have to stay there. That's the hope. May we, may we embrace the hope that is truly hope. May we embrace the fullness of our guilt and in it experience the beauty of his grace, his amazing forgiveness, all that he's taken from us. And may we bring that to the world around us. Will you pray with me? Father, as we talk through this and as we look at what you're teaching us, Father, I pray that you would open our eyes, that you would open our eyes so two things. One, that you'd, that you'd allow us to be able to see the depth of our brokenness. That you'd allow us to be able to see the impact and the pain and the destruction that sin has not only brought into our lives, but that our sin has brought into the lives of those around us. I pray that we would be aware of that so that we might be able to celebrate the reality that you took all of that on you on the cross. That Jesus, you took all of our guilt and all of our shame and all of our brokenness and all of our evil on you so that we could be forgiven. Father, we want to love you well because we understand the depth of your love but in order for us to do that, we have to understand the depth of our evil. And so I pray that you would open our eyes to that so that we might be able to celebrate Jesus the way he deserves to be celebrated. Father, I thank you for the hope. Not that this is all that there is, but the hope that you are restoring the hope that one day there will be an end to all of the sin and all of the pain. In Jesus' name, amen.